so um, I've tried a number of times to, to talk about this, but it's always kind of hasn't really worked out. But I'm finally going to uh, try it now because I kind of have, I like the style where I sort of walk, um, I'm, I'm pacing around as I'm sure you can tell from kind of my voice. I take a lot of deep breaths because I've I'm sort of walking around constantly. It just helps me to, to talk. It helps me feel more casual. Um, you know, it, it's almost like my it helps to get my mind moving so it doesn't get stuck anywhere. Um, but anyway, what I want to talk about, and I've, I'm sure that those of you who've watched um, my video logs, you know, um, I, I don't bring it up as that much, at least I don't think I do, but um, I'm pretty sure in one of those, one of the earlier ones, I've brought up one of the struggles that I've kind of uh, dealt with mentally. Um, and uh, uh, by the way, I'll probably, I might sound like I'm about to cry, That's pro that, that, that uh, is only because, once again, I'm walking around and so I have to take these deep breaths and so sometimes my voice gets a little warbly. Please don't. That I'll let you know if I'm legitimately crying, but I don't think that's... Uh, uh, there shouldn't be any problem with that. <laughs> I don't think that, you know, it. Uh, that's not really how I work in these kinds of things. But um, anyway, so just so you know, and aren't getting super, super worried. But uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this is so... I have struggled with the diagnosis as obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety, and so um, I've wanted to talk about it and sort of talk about, because this is sort of what I do, I like to take complex concepts, or at least concepts that I think are complex, and try to um, uh, simplify them, make it, or not, not simplify them, actually but to present them, to figure out, to sort of untangle all of the different threads, figure out what is sort of the essential principles going on here from which everything else kind of branches out naturally. And I want to make it very consistent and make it very straightforward and clear so that there's no kind of getting um, lost in it. And that's kind of how I operate. And so I naturally do this with really anything that I'm interested in, I kind of try to to untangle it and figure out, okay, what's really going on here and can I sort of straighten this out? Um, this is very much the feeling, is, is straightening things out. Um, but anyway, so I want to talk about uh, OCD and what it really is and sort of my insights on it for, uh, you know, posterity or whatever. Because <laughs> I just feel like it's it's it would be helpful, and I think it would be helpful for other people at least to hear from someone else who's struggling with it. Um, I'm going to render a guess that there's probably a number of people who um, have not been or and never will be officially diagnosed with OCD, maybe with something else, um, but uh, just because of the way that the system works and, and getting diagnosis and who's the therapist doing it and and this and that and whatever, um, so all kinds of social things going on. That's a very complex question, but I have met quite a few people who haven't been diagnosed with anything, but I related to them like perfectly. Um, I'm thinking of one specific person. Uh, in particular, by the way, but not just them, with other people, too. Um, I've seen these patterns that are really kind of self-destructive and not healthy, but they don't know what to do about it because no one else knows what's going on. And I'll talk about that more because there's, there's a lot to talk about here. But uh, to begin with, um, for those of you who are not familiar with OCD, it is not what you think it is. This is a very unfortunate, in fact, it's probably the number one reason. Well, maybe not the, well, probably actually, at least in America, the number one reason why people are, don't realize what they're actually dealing with here, um, because they literally have no conception of what real OCD is. So there's a whole sort of uh, uh, 
form of that mental difficulties can take or unhealthy thought can take that people are, don't sort of have under the radar. They have, you know, most people have very sort of, at the very least, warped conceptions of, of depression or like, you know, of schizophrenia. Once again, very warped. Um, and I'll probably get backlash because there are, I'm sure, people who like have no conception or whatsoever. And there's been, uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but I'll press forward. Um, my apologies uh, for my ignorance, but that's not something that I, well, anyway, I'll, I'll get to that in, in a bit. But uh, um, the point was, is that the media portrays OCD and people think of OCD. And in fact, OCD has become basically synonymous with sort of compulsive organization of things that everything needs to be just right. You know, the show Monk, um, which is a good show. I've watched it. I like the episodes, but, um, and, but I think it's a very misleading portrayal of actual OCD. I think that what Monk's going through is actually better defined by other things. I don't know what, but it's not really, you know, when I say that I've struggled with OCD, people sort of assume, oh, he secretly organizes things. And it's like, no, actually, I literally, <laughs> I, I don't give a crap about that. I don't relate to that. And that's why I haven't, that's, that's why I, I didn't really realize and had sort of just kept on the down low a lot of the things I was struggling with because I just sort of assumed that it was just weird stuff with me personally, individually that I was going through and anyway, I'll, I, I'll keep on saying, I'll get to that later because I'm trying to get to the point here, but, um, anyway, so with, uh, I'm only mentioning that because I'm, I want to kind of try to uh, contribute just another voice to sort of explain what OCD actually is. And I'd love to call it by another name, but, um, I, I don't want to get people confused. So I'll just stick with OCD here. OCD, as I experience it, mind you, um, it, it's, it's what happens when, say, you're going to get groceries, and you, you've got the groceries, and uh, you go to, like, the, it's just like a couple things, like a gallon, a gallon of milk or whatever, and you go to the self-checkout. Uh, line where you've got like the little machine and you sort of you run the barcodes over the scanners yourself and you pay for it so let's say that you do that and uh, you have to pull out your wallet to get your debit card or whatever and you pay for it and your kind of your mind is elsewhere because um, for whatever reason like because you're NI or FI dominant or something <laughs> and um, so your minds are, you're, well, quite a few other types than that. You're, you're a human being, and, <laughs> but, uh, so you've got your groceries and you're heading out the door and suddenly the thought hits you, oh crap, where's my wallet? And, uh, and so you sort of compulsively reach your hand into your, your pocket to see if your wallet's there and feel around for it. And if it's not there, then the anxiety will probably shoot up a spike and you'll kind of start going, oh, no, 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 crap, 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 crap. And you go walking back in. Hopefully you find the wallet and you won't stop until you find the wallet because you need to find it. And in the very unfortunate chance that you don't find it, then, you know, the anxiety will kind of stay at a general level until you've found it or resolved it or gotten some kind of resolution to the problem. So what's going on here uh, is in your brain, and I'm going to get to brains in a minute, by the way, because that can be a controversial subject, uh, but in bear with me, in the brain, um, what's going on is you are motivated to search for your wallet, as I've already implied, by this sort of spike of anxiety. So there's chemicals for that in the brain that sort of tell you, just like there's chemicals that let you know that you're feeling pain. And if those are out of whack, you know, then, then, then you get people who like get broken legs and don't realize it. And then they die young. If you've ever heard stories about people who literally can't feel pain, anxiety is just the same way, but for very cognitive things, you know, uh, which is extraordinarily useful. You see, like if you have misplaced a tool, like your wallet, then you'll, you've trained your brain to register that as important. And, uh, therefore 
when you suddenly think to yourself, oh wait, crap, do I have my wallet or not? Then you immediately go reach down to check to resolve that issue. And once you resolve it, the anxiety level goes down and you're almost like, oh, thank heavens. And it almost feels good because of the contrast of the anxiety versus not having the anxiety. So th this is sort of with normal, what normally happens uh, or what's supposed to happen with the brain. Um, and it makes sense uh, and it's useful. With OCD, what's happened is the anxiety, the, 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 the chemicals or the, the, the neurotransmitters that release the anxiety, something is out of whack so that for you, and not for everything, um, but for, uh, for certain things, generally speaking, whatever is most important, that's at least how it is for me, but in some sense for everything. You know, you're walking out of the store and you think to yourself, oh wait, do I have my wallet? And you reach into your pocket and you do, you have your wallet and you're like, perfect. And then you keep walking, but you're still anxious. You feel anxious again. And you're like, wait, did I really feel my wallet? Like, or was that just because I know that sometimes my brain will just sort of want to know my wallet's there and I'll just sort of assume, but then suddenly realize a little bit later, like, did I really just feel my wallet just then? So you reach your hand in your pocket again to check that your wallet's there. You're like, okay. And then a few minutes later, you're like, what if it like fell out of, you're still nervous and you're like racking your brain, like, why am I still nervous? It, it, actually, it's not even really like that. It's not that you're racking your brain to figure out why you're nervous. It just kind of happens so fast that in your brain, you, you know, for me, it's almost like you almost like see an image or have this apprehension that what if a hole tore in my pocket and my wallet fell out down my pant leg, which is ridiculous, but you still think it and you're feeling all of the right responses as though that were a rational conclusion. So you reach your hand into your pocket. Soon enough, you're walking around everywhere with your hand compulsively grabbing grabbing your wallet to make sure it doesn't go anywhere and you're still freaking nervous, uh, you know, as though it's going to melt. Now this is sort of an, ex uh, this is a very exaggerated example and I don't think anyone's ever had this kind of thing happen with like the wallet. Although maybe you had, but you've probably heard stories of, you know, a classic example would be somebody who compulsively checks the oven. Um, you know, that when they go out of the house, they suddenly think to themselves, oh crap, did I leave the oven on? Because if I did, the house is going to freaking burn down and everything's going to go horrible. My, or, you know, my kids will die or <laughs> everything will go wrong. And it'll all be because I just didn't take the time, a little bit of time to go check the oven. So you go and you check it like a normal person, but you go out and the anxiety will not go away because you think to yourself, what if somehow it turned on? What if there was a short circuit? What if I didn't, I didn't check it enough? So you go back and you check it. And in extreme cases um, of OCD and like say this case, you'd get people who like have a, uh, it, 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 inter it interferes with their life because they cannot leave the house without checking the oven like a specific number of times. Um, but I even hesitate to say specific because the times generally increases uh, the more times you do it. So this is very classic obsessive compulsive disorder. So what's going on, once again, is you obsess over something because your anxiety centers aren't shutting off and they just keep on flowing material through. You keep on soaking your brain in anxiety even after you've checked. And so it, that's, it, you get into this cycle where you obsess and so you perform what would normally, it, you perform a compulsion, which in other situations, we would probably call it a compulsion and there wouldn't be a problem, such as sort of compulsively checking your pocket to see if your wallet's there. If you do it one time, even twice, it's fine, but if you're doing it 128 times and you won't feel better until you've done it 128 times, then you've got a serious problem. Um, so you get kind of the general idea of this is what's going on. So this, so the organization thing, or like, you know, I have to have things just right. That's a very sort of warped, warped kind of, I, I'm, you can tell I'm not a fan of it. Obviously I have very uh, vested interests in this, but, um, that stems from this notion of, I'll feel anxious until this is organized just right. 
But the fact of the matter is that the majority of people, um, I gotta hesitate to say that because I, I can't say whether or not, but there is a significant number of people who, for them, they show these symptoms, but it does not follow that pattern at all. There's a lot of people who, they don't have really that problem with the oven, you know. Uh, I've never really had that problem. Maybe there's a bit more anxiety there. There's more of a tendency or an ability uh, via the imagination to sort of conjure up the idea. Um, and that, that's a part of this too, at least for me, is it stems a lot from my ability to imagine things. It's very easy for me to, to uh, you know, I tend to be very creative. I'm not tooting my own horn because I know that's sort of a, uh, a truism that creativity is good or whatever, but um, for me it's just sort of a matter of I can make associations, I can put things together, I can imagine things, I can imagine possibilities pretty easily. Um, all of you people who think that I'm an INTP are like, HE HAS ANY! Don't deny it! And I'm like, I will till you can pry INFJ from my cold, dead fingers. Anyway, because I think this is an NI thing as well as an any thing. But anyway, that's not what this is about. <laughs> the point is, is that, you know, in, say, the oven example, it's a matter of, I can justify this. I can justify this anxiety given just a little bit more creativity of why the oven could be this way. And but, you know, as I've really thought about it, that the mistake, and by the way, I'm not, I'm not qualified or anything. I'm just sort of talking about my own experiences, and hopefully there's others out there who could find use from it. But, well, you know what, I'll, I'll get to that part later, uh, hopefully, or, or it'll get ironed out with other things, because there's other, th other things I want to talk about. I want to get more into other ways that this manifests, and in my opinion, my unqualified opinion, the more common ways that OCD manifests than sort of the traditional, like, say, compulsive hand washing, where you, you get it in your head that, you know, your family will die from diseases unless you wash your hands because you're so, you're afraid. And so here, this is sort of the problem, is people assume this is the big problem with OCD, is you, the justification isn't the problem. Uh, the real problem is your brain isn't working right, and you can't stop feeling anxious about this thing because of various reasons. And it's like, but for every person, we justify things, we try to explain things, you know, and so with something abnormal like this, you get somebody, so let me, let me give uh, a pretty raw example here of what I'm talking about. I think that a, there's a great deal of OCD that manifests as what I'll sort of hesitatingly call, it's very, almost like a social kind of OCD or something that's focused in sort of these beliefs about, beliefs about things rather than a bit more concrete, like the washing your hands or oven turning. I apologize if people have struggled with that. I, I hope I'm not making it sound like that's less important, even though I basically am. Dang it. <laughs> I don't mean that. Uh, please make your own videos explaining more about that for those who need it, because I, I've never, I haven't really dealt with that, but I, I understand the principle and I've had it a little bit. Okay, I'm going to finally get to my point. Sorry. The point is, um, Excuse me, sorry. That, you know, there you get somebody, and th this is a true account, by the way, not from, from me, but uh, from uh, accounts of OCD that in my research I've kind of encountered, you know. You might get somebody who, for some reason, uh, gets it in their head that they, what if I'm secretly a pedophile, right? Now... What what this what that means is that they, um, like for instance, maybe they're babysitting the kids, and for some reason, like the thought just kind of crosses your mind: What if I were to molest one of these kids? Because the mind just sort of does that. Uh, it you know, like that moment where you're holding a baby and you think to yourself, "What if? What would happen if I just threw this baby against the wall?" And you're like, "Oh, how could I think that?" 
Well, you add OC and you feel anxious and obviously you're going to make freaking sure that you don't drop that baby. But with OCD, you can understand where this would become an enormous problem because you won't stop feeling anxious from that idea of you doing something horrible to these children or something like this, something that is very... And that's why it'll happen so often with these kinds of extremely extreme unsettling things because they're extreme and unsettling and they produce anxiety and they produce the most anxiety. So, you know, you get somebody who kind of gets it in their head that, you know, I'm still feeling anxious that I'm going to do something to these children and every motion that I make, I think to myself, what if that was sort of unconsciously me trying to grope a child and you get very horrified by this because it's really uh, disgusting and but you can't get it out of your head and the more that you work against it the more it gets revved up and the more it and and so you know soon enough you're like I don't want to babysit kids anymore because what if I'm actually a pedophile secretly and by the way you know that sounds really ridiculous it's like how can you how can you not know <laughs> how can you not know that <laughs> You know, but it's it's not rational. And by the way, the sufferer of OCD, a classic symptom is that they realize better than anyone else, even, that this is not rational. This makes no sense. But that doesn't matter because your body doesn't care if it makes sense. Your body's just going to keep on producing anxiety and warping your reality. And so in a weird way, I mean, I, it, 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 in some ways, it kind of turns into a belief disorder. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm misusing the term schizophrenia, I'm heavily misusing that, but you know, it almost starts to turn into that in a weird way, because you're, literally your view of reality is getting skewed because the elements, you know, because our view of reality is not just the five senses, it's our emotions about things, it's our feelings about the reality around us, and that includes things like anxiety. If you're, you know, classic, I think this is something Heidegger, uh, Martin Heidegger pointed out, is, you know, if you're in a cafe and you're waiting for um, somebody to come join you at the cafe, your experience of that cafe is totally different than if you had just gone in there, because you've got this sense of apprehension. I shouldn't say apprehension, but just sort of anticipation. And suddenly things are different. And it's just this, you know, you notice different things. It's the same way with OCD, where if you're anxious about things, your view of reality will get skewed, and suddenly you're sort of making very bizarre conclusions because you can't figure any other way to deal with it. Just like, you know, if everywhere you went you were hearing voices, or everywhere you went, um, you saw Puff the Magic Dragon, no one's ever really had that, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but I'm just trying to get it out there. If you, you know, you're walking around and you see dragons everywhere, then you've got to be able to justify that. Um, with the dragons, obviously, if that just suddenly happened, you'd, you know, probably be sensible enough to go get help, but anyway, I've gone on a long tangent, I apologize. I hope some of this is helpful. But going back to OCD and going back to what I sort of had in mind, um, you get a situation like this where you get somebody who starts to, th starts to think to themselves, you know, they just, they get really worried of what if I'm a pedophile? And then every, everything that they do, every thought that they have regarding children suddenly becomes cause for pain and cause for anxiety and they're kind of like no i that's a sign of this that's triggering this i need to get rid of that i need to suppress that's the thing about ocd um is that very naturally i think it either it was there before or it helps to develop i think it's a combination of both um you become hyper vigilant um you become v really very self-controlling, like, I think, anyway, that's how I think it is for me, and, and in some cases, and there's elements that were there before, but, um, you know, you, you sort of have to force yourself to be in 
sort of impo really just impossibly and damn you know, dangerously controlling of everything in order to kind of ensure that this doesn't happen. Um, so this is sort of a form of OCD. It's a bit, it, it's a bit more abstract to connect with the oven situation, but it's the same thing where, you know, you, you feel, you get obsessed with this idea of what if I were to hurt these children, just like what if my wallet's missing? And I didn't realize it. And so you sort of do a compulsion. The compulsion might be physical. It might be, I will remove myself immediately from the situation and go hide somewhere where I, you know, and you see it, you'd see that as this is a noble thing I am doing. I am, um, uh, I am self-sacrificing for the sake of these children because I perceive there's something wrong with me and so I'm going to overcome that. And, you know, you kind of take a certain, uh, frankly, masochistic, sadomasochistic pleasure in that. <laughs> I'm being very frank um, in that, well, at the, at the very least, at least I have the sense and the decency in me to, to curb myself, uh, you know. But anyway, so it might be a physical action, but in a lot of cases, that's not possible. Or the person has enough sense to not do that in certain situations. And so it has to be a mental thing. And by that, it's just a compulsion of, you know, you just trying to shush the thought or I, oh, now I need to compulsively do something else. You know, you sing a song or something to yourself to, to get it to go away. But as with all, all of these things, it's in a weird way, it's like a, in, it's an internal system addiction. You build up a pattern um, that ultimately isn't self-sustainable. The pattern is if I check then eventually I'll get the, um, the anxiety to turn off. It's like, a, it's like if the anxiety is turned on by a button. Most people, the button is like super slick and new and it stays that way. And you know, you press it once or you hold it down to keep the anxiety flowing and then you lift it up and, and it stops, it lifts up all the way. But with OCD, the button is like got some weird stuff stuck in there. And so when you push it down, sometimes it doesn't pop back up. And so you have to keep on like pressing it, like jamming it in to try to get it to pop back up again. And so that's the compulsion. So you check your pocket, you check the oven, or you check your thoughts. Um, by doing something in your head, um, you know, you might have heard things about people like counting or compulsively praying, but sometimes it can be even more nebulous than that. It can just simply be you uh, it doesn't feel like it's because it's so sort of emotionally charged that it doesn't feel like it's this repetitive thing. It feels sort of amorphous that it's just like I'm just so intensely like doing things to, to try to get that button to pop up and get relief and convince myself, no, everything's okay. I'm not going to hurt these children or I'm not going to do this horrible thing or what, what not. And obviously it just makes it worse because the next time around the button will get stuck for longer and you have to do more things in your head and soon enough you can't really function or you have a nervous breakdown or whatever. So, you know, and uh, part of the problem with this is that it's, you know, it very naturally targets those very things that we're the most nervous about. Uh, and very often we're so nervous about them because they're sort of social, they're, they're, uh, for very, um, you know, generally speaking, for very uh, uh, good reasons, or I don't, I don't want to say good reasons, but very uh, perfectly understandable reasons, taboo, like pedophilia, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, you know, if you start getting terrified that, oh my gosh, what if I'm a pedophile, because I, ha I keep on, you know, I had this thought of molesting these children. I tried to get rid of it, but it kept on coming back. And, oh my gosh, now I have an erection or I'm aroused, which, you know, just sort of happens because you're like freaking out inside. <laughs> and your body, your body doesn't care. Your body's just, I, I, you know, but you, if you said anything like that to a normal person, because the subject is so taboo, you know, it's kind of like they won't respond well. And you know that. You're afraid of that. And it's very difficult for people who don't struggle with this to kind of figure out what is going on. Why, you know, 
you know, you get a really good friend and you explain this to him and he's like, you know, the first time I'm like, that's, that's, that's stupid. Why, why would you think that? Why would you make that connection? And you feel better, but then you feel anxious again. So then you go back and try to get that, that calming from that one person again. And it's like, you have to talk with them longer and they, and then soon enough, they're kind of like, what is going on? Like, why, why are you so afraid of this? And if it goes on for long enough, it's almost like it can spread to other people that they're, you know, they don't know what OCD is. They don't know kind of how the mind works in that way. So eventually they might start wondering, is my friend secretly a pedophile? Because they really can't seem to get this out of your head. Because they're not experiencing it. All Generally all they know is that this person is keeps on coming to them incredibly distressed that they keep on having thoughts of molesting children and they can't get it out and they do everything they can and oh my gosh, you know, I an erection I had coincidentally timed with, <laughs> with, with uh, what was going on or I was afraid I was going to get an erection and it was so real that I mixed up whether or not I was actually getting an erection and just kind of thought that I was or I might as well have because I was thinking about it and it just gets ridiculous. Um, and very frustrating and very distressing, and uh, it's hell. And, you know, you try to tell other people to try to get help, but, you know, it's so difficult because they don't understand what's going on. And the only recourse they have, you know, in their mind, it's just like, okay, either they are a pedophile, which is very unlikely, or they aren't. But, you know, how long has it got to go on before it's kind of like, I don't understand what's going on. Um, and so it's very hard with these taboo subjects that it's like, you know, in fact, generally people don't want to talk about it for that reason. Because it's like you're so afraid that, because you feel like, um, and this is where it gets really complicated and really kind of dark is, excuse me, sorry. It gets dark where you start getting into these really moral areas where, you know, someone who struggles with that, especially a religious person, um, is going to feel, is going to assume that their anxiety, or they'll just legitimately feel tremendous guilt over these things, or fear, moral fear. And you don't have to be religious, especially with something like pedophilia or like murdering someone. Uh, there are stories of like a father who has OCD and starts to become afraid that he's going to murder his children, like in The Shining or something. The son is just going to snap, and then all of a sudden, every time he's holding a knife, anytime his kids want to play with him, uh, if he's in a bad mood, he'll suddenly become terrified that he's going to snap, and it's not rational, because it's not how it works. But in his head, it's like, what if it does? Because he has the imagination, he has the creativity to sort of summon up, what if it does? What if? I don't have absolute scientific certainty, you know, philosophical Cartesian certainty, like I think therefore I am, That's it's almost like if I could just get that, if I could just get absolute certainty that I'm not going to do this thing or this thing isn't really this way or I don't, I really don't need to be worried. But if there's that point zero 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 percent you know, 1% chance that I might do it, then that's not acceptable. I'm not going to play, I'm not going to gamble with my family's life that I'm going to suddenly snap and kill them, you know. And so you kind of get this mentality of, you get people who are incredibly upright and do not stand, you know, they, they, don't, they don't stand for that kind of thing. They're like, I'm not going to gamble with my family's life. I love my family. I have a duty for them. I'm going to do anything for them. Uh, you know, and OCD just sort of runs amok with that because if you really are willing to do anything, then all OCD has to do is convince you that there's the slightest chance that this might happen and next thing you know, well, uh, they're doing all kinds of things. Um, or the one big thing, you know. I'm talking about suicide. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I'm sorry. It's just the way I, I, I set that up. It was really incredibly awkward. Um, I should have just I should have just said suicide. Anyway, but you get the idea. Um, so, but that's kind of where it 
it comes from is you get this notion of if there's even, you know, this is so important to me. This is so morally important to me. I, you know, or I define myself by my love for my family. But I, this is happening to me. This isn't acceptable. If there's even a, a, even a tiny portion of a percent chance that this could happen, then how can I possibly be morally justified in not taking action against that? And this is, this is the mentality. So this is where, you know, things get very difficult then when you're trying to help treat this, especially if it's a moral thing, you know. If you have somebody who's scared that they're a pedophile, even though that's ridiculous, um, you know, if you try to, you know, generally speaking, one of the ways you try to deal with this is basically, uh, I, they never referred to it as this, but really one of the, one of the first kind of things that a lot of people try is they call it, um, there's cognitive behavioral therapy and often included in that, at least it was for me, was really what I realized later was sort of Buddhism light or meditation light, you know, this kind of without referring to uh, some of the Buddhist dogmas, but this, the mindfulness, mindfulness. Um, you ever seen Steven Universe? You've seen the mindful education? That's what they do. It's literally that's that. I, I very much appreciated that episode because they were at least trying to bring in some of these basic uh, things to deal with OCD and anxiety, which is you have to not take those thoughts so seriously. Yeah, there's a zero, zero percent, one percent chance, I guess, that you'll kill your family. Except there's not, frankly. I mean, because you're not going to do that. It's not in your nature to do that. So it's not going to happen. And you can't think of the world as sort of this roulette wheel. That that's, you know, a possibility. And But... It's so hard because if you tell that to somebody who's afraid that they're going to murder their family, he's like, you're just, if I listen to you, what if, what if you're wrong <laughs> and I'll kill my family and it'll be my fault and also partially your fault, but mainly my fault for listening to you because you didn't know any better. Uh, I, I must be the self-sacrificing martyr to, to endure this, you know, <laughs> and it kind of is like, that's how you feel. That's how... Um, from the subjects that it would be with me is how I would feel. Um, it's like I need, this is just sort of my demon that I need to, to deal with. And it's like, no, actually. It's not, it's not how the world ought to work. Um, everybody needs, everybody needs friends. Everybody needs to not be so f scared of these kinds of things. Um, so, you know, but that's where it gets hard, uh, you know, because the person will have taken on certain compulsions and habits of mind or of body that they follow to prevent this thing from happening. And they just get so used to this, depending on how it works for them, um, that this is sort of the cycle that for them, it's kind of like, if I let up even for a second, then like, if I let up even for a second, then uh, uh, everything might fly apart. So it kind of almost becomes like, you're secretly in league with the devil. Obviously, that's for, you know, very religious people who are <laughs> something like that, you know. And, and by the way, you know, if they're thinking that, they're not really thinking that. It's more just, it's like the, the part of your mind that's looking for those possibilities will start screaming that at the top of its lungs. And it's like, well, you can't help but listen to that. But with any OCD, it's almost, it very much is kind of like this battle between this very rational, calm, correct person in you, who sort of, that's you, that's actually you, but then like there's this other part of you that's developed that just is, is like screaming in your ear that, what if this, what if that, you have to do this, you, you must go do that. You, you, you have to do this compulsion or your family will die. I prophesy it and, uh, you know, they're crazy. But it's like, you know, they're screaming in your ear. It's really, you know, and this is terrifying stuff. And they're showing you visions of it. You can imagine this. You can feel it almost in like this, almost how it was to this point with me anyway. You know, it was almost to the point of I could almost like feel, um, 
it's kind of hard to describe, but it's like, because I just have a very powerful imagination, that it was almost like I could just, I could feel the, 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 the fear, the sensation in me of what if this thing happens, and, you know, you could, you, you could just imagine you doing the thing, like there was um, one example that I related to anyway, there was a fellow who just had this bizarre terror that he was going to cut off his fingers, and... Uh, that, which is very strange and bizarre and disturbing. And so obviously he wasn't going to tell anybody except under great conditions because it's like, what are, you, what are you talking about? You keep on having visions of self-mutilation? That's really freaky and you don't want to think about that. But it happens. And so he had this thought that what if I cut off my fingers? And this is where it gets kind of very strange, um, by the way. But his compulsion to deal with that is... He actually got into a compulsion where um, he he would go to a place alone and he would, in order to kind of try to deal with it, he would let this sort of uh, fantasy play itself out almost in like a, a cathartic way to almost like to kind of show I'm not afraid of this anxiety. I will not be scared of it. I will let... You know, I will imagine this in gratuitous detail, but it becomes another compulsion. And, you know, you, uh, uh, you know, it, it gets very complex, and I'm kind of twisting things around, and I hope I'm not suggesting imperatives, you know, that will cause other people problems, you know. Um, but I'm just trying to kind of cover all the different things that I remember as I've studied this and as I've gone through it. Um, you know, so... Where it gets really, I think, very common, because um, for me, it was all compulsions that centered around the fear that uh, somehow I had done. And it, even, even now, after a couple of years of therapy, it's hard for me to mention it, because it, it still kind of makes me nervous. And I'm talking about this, now that I think about it, to like thousands of people. <laughs> who might watch this. But I feel like it's very important that if I'm going to talk about this, I need to talk about, um, not altogether, but, you know, I need to at least mention uh, the part for me. And I'm building it up like it's this great big thing, but, you know, I think a lot of people struggle because it's such a taboo topic. I was so terrified of... Um, for years and years and years that, you know, somehow, some way I had done, you know, I had done something wrong sexually, like I thought something wrong, um, or I had indulged in thoughts or these kinds of things. And, uh, and, and I don't, look, look, I'm, I'm figuring that out uh, in my own way through therapy. Um, please, I, I am, I am, please, I am not interested in hearing your opinion. I know that you care about me and you're looking to help because you think that, oh, well, I've gone through that and this is how I've solved it. Please don't, please don't be giving me advice. I assure you that I, that w through therapy, I have found perfectly, you know, I have found the proper ways to deal with this that are not unhealthy that are not, that I feel completely at peace with, that are not causing problems. So please, I know that this is, I'm, I'm saying this because I've had this happen before. So please, I'm not looking for suggestions or, or any kind of diatribes because I know that it's a very touchy subject. Um, the whole kind of thing of sort of sexually, rep you know, repressing yourself, your sexual thoughts and being so terrified of ever even thinking of something, you know, or these kinds of things. And um, it's, uh, you know, I'm not going to talk about it in detail, but I, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it at all, but I think I should have because I know that there's other people out there. And, um, you know, if you ever want to talk one-on-one, -on -one, you can send me a message. I apologize if it takes me a little while to get to you. I, I've been more bad about that lately, but, you know, um, but, you know, it'd be a thing like, uh, it's very hard in that situation because especially if you're in, in, in an environment where 
uh, it's sort of expected that you are, that you're um, supposed to kind of, you're supposed to be like pure in this sense. And once again, I know that there's people, and I complete, I completely relate to you, by the way. Um, I'm, I, I, I hope I'm not shutting any of you, any of you guys down. I know exactly what you're talking about. Once again, send me a, send me a private message if you wanted to talk about it. Um, but, you know, please understand, I tend to be a very private person, and so the fact that I'm talking about this out here is, is, uh, is hard. So please, please don't take it personally if there's some things I don't respond to or anything like that. It's just I, I tend to be very private, and, uh, and it's sometimes I get overwhelmed. But anyway, it's taking me forever to get through this. I apologize. Um, but, you know, you're in an environment where it's sort of expected that this be a thing. And so, um, you know, for, for someone like me, uh, who struggles with OCD, it's like, you go completely off the rails <laughs> with this. And it, you know, it, it's like, you don't, you don't feel like you can talk about it because you're afraid that, because you know in your heart that what's going on is not normal and is not in the train of thought that other people seem to think. Because people kind of have it in their heads that the only way that this works is you get sort of, you indulge in sexual fantasies and things. And that's how it works. You know, it's, the way that it works is it's a one-track thing where if you start indulging, then it's very much, you're just falling for a pleasure and you're just going to follow that pleasure, and you're going to become addicted to that pleasure. And it's like, actually, um, I have strong feelings about this now. Maybe that's the case, but for others, that is not the case for me. That's not how it works. I don't need pleasure, you know. I don't need it. That's not, the, that's never been an issue here. The issue for me is... Um, for the longest time, was being so afraid if I even had the the inclination that that I might start thinking about uh, anything sexual or anything like that, I'd just get sort of racked with um, uh, just fear and guilt and all these kinds of things, and it would just kind of overwhelm me. And it was a miracle that I was able to operate at all. Um, and uh, for you know, for the longest time, most of my preteen and teenage years, it was sort of like that, and I struggled with trying to explain this to other people, because for them, who didn't really struggle with this, it was kind of like, well, okay, it's because you're, you know, it's because you're a growing kid, so you're just trying to figure this out, you know, it's natural, and it's like, well, actually, no, it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. I was not having a normal teenage experience, and I basically haven't had one. I've kind of had to pick up the pieces afterwards. Once again, I've sort of uh, broken through that and sort of been able to, to make peace with it. And, you know, uh, oddly enough, well, not oddly enough, perfectly understandable, the OCD hasn't troubled me with that really um, much at all anymore as I've kind of been able to figure things out, but it's latched on to other things. Um, like, uh, uh, I'm applying to grad school right now, and I, I think I really actually started recording this because I suddenly realized, you know, I'm, like, really <laughs> freaking anxious about this. Like, it's becoming really difficult for me to get this grad work done. Like, I don't even want to think about it or do anything about it. Because I'm just so nervous, and I can't even figure out why, and I suddenly thought, is this OCD? No, this is not, this, you know, because I've associated it so much with the whole sort of sexual repression thing. And, uh, but then, you know, for things like this, it's like, no, you're, you're kind of, you're checking your wallet. You, you know, you're kind you know, you, every moment that you spend walking away from your grad school application, you think to yourself, you have a limited amount of time to get this done, you know. Every moment that you spend... Uh, you know, it, and it happens with OCD a lot, where it's almost like you can feel every moment counting down, every, every second just running past, and it just racks up on your clock, you know, is what it feels like, that you're in the red, as it were. You know, with the thoughts, it was kind of like every moment that I spend still kind of having this around, 
um, is like I'm more in the red here, and that's like more stuff that I've got to account for later. And uh, and it wasn't ever as cut and dry as that, generally speaking, because there was always that rational part of me that knew that this wasn't normal. And that that's one thing I would like to stress, by the way, is that it, it was an ab it was very much an abnormal thing. It was not it wasn't a result um, of of my belief system or anything like that because there was a part in me that th held the belief system and knew that this isn't a problem. This is, you know, you can figure, you know, there are aspects that were from uh, just the culture and everything, but I'm not going to talk about that here. Um, but by and large, it was sort of me, rational, calm, forgiving me. I don't even want to say forgiving, just uh, patient and uh, totally chill me versus this sort of bloated... Uh, irrational id that is sort of insisting all the time that something is wrong and you need to do something to fix it. You've got to pray compulsively until you feel better about it, until you finally like get the forgiveness or something like that. So that's why it can be so very awkward for people is because it it can crop it. it and by the way, it is a big it is a big mistake to assume that this is something that crops up only in religion. Um, I have a friend in, in, in particular who I think has, you know, a, uh, I would never, I don't ever want to tell them, or, well, I already have, but it's like I'm not ever going to push on them what they've been struggling with or anything, but, you know, they are very much not religious, you know, they're just, uh, uh, a, uh, agnostic, uh, even, even atheist, you know, it's in that area, and they still struggle with this, um, just as much uh, uh, if not more than me. And so it's, it's a big mistake to assume that it, uh, it only revolves around... Anyway, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to get into that. That's not really what this is about. Uh, man, I'm off the rails here, but it's... It's a very hard thing. Uh, if, if I do end up... <laughs> I feel like I'm posting a note, like, before... <laughs> <laughs> like I'm a spy and I'm like about to go out on a mission and I'm like, if you can only listen to this after I die, you know, I, I, I hope, please don't worry. I, sorry to bring death into this. I don't mean to, you, you know what I mean by that, but I just thought that cause I was kind of like, Oh, I don't know if I'm going to post this. Uh, I'll probably have to listen to it compulsively several times over, of course, before I don't feel comfortable with it and then just post it anyway. Because that's how it works, but, um, I don't know, I, I think I've sort of more or less spoken my piece. It, I'm sure there's elements that I said I was going to get to, but I haven't because I forgot about them. Um, I haven't really talked at all about ways to deal with this. I think, you know, uh, maybe I'll make a different podcast on that, but I think what's most important is that you, if, you know, you're recognizing these things, then just... Look up on, not just anywhere, but because there's a lot of weird things, like, you know, this one guy uh, with glasses who makes typology videos, you know, he, he made this really weird podcast about it, uh, you know, so don't, don't listen to him, because he's a whack job, but, <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> just kidding, um, I, I hope that I'm worth listening to, but anyway, you know, look up in those areas, you know, if anything helped me, um, it was, first of all, just being able to recognize, wait, what if this isn't, like, what if it's not that I just have, like, a, a devilish sex drive or something that I just can't, you know, get my will to accept this, which I knew was ridiculous and just stupid sounding, but it, you know, it was the only thing in my head then because I was still so anxious. It's like, what if, what if, what if that's not true? What if it really is kind of what my rational part of me sort of suspects, um, you know, suspects against all of the suspecting that things are actually okay and uh, things are not that scary and things are going to work out and, you know, I'll get my grad application stuff done and I'll get it sent off. And if I don't, 
whatever, you know, maybe something will happen and I'll just deal with it. That's part of why I like Nietzsche so much. Amor Fati, the love of fate, you know, that's, he was probably uh, one of the most helpful figures for helping me to, to get out of it. I can't promise that anybody reading him would um, sort of get the same effect that I did, uh, but, uh, you know, you kind of have to dig for it, but anyway, you know, um, and there's a lot more to it, you know, I've mentioned the mindfulness thing, um, but uh, if anything, it's just being able to understand, you know, look up other people's stories and, and, you know, you're not alone if you are going through this kind of thing, like, seriously, it's not uncommon, I mean, I guess, you know, it's technically uncommon in that it's like, technically it's not a majority, but I don't even know how that stuff works. And so, you know, I don't know if you've listened this far into the podcast. Um, maybe you have, just as another side note, you know, I, you'll notice I'm pretty sure I haven't used the words mental disorder because I didn't want it. That has connotations. I don't mean, I believe I have a disorder because what I, what I'll call a disorder, because there's something disorderly in my brain that I take meds for that I think help. Um, but I've also got to do other things to help. But even if it's not on a level where you need meds, I think a lot of people have this happen to them where the button gets stuck and it can be very frustrating or stressful. Actually, it will be very frustrating. It's not a matter of can, it will be, <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, um, and it's terrifying. At least it is for me. It's terrifying because you just, you're afraid that, um, you know, I still have that little fear that because I sort of have defined myself in certain ways as, as having immense self-control and so kind of having this fear that somehow I don't have that sort of monk-like self-control, even though it's not on that paradigm, um, you know, just being afraid that, you know, if I put this out there, I'll, I'll be sort of terrified that other people will just assume that, oh, well, he really, it's not OCD. He's just using that to cover up the real problem. And, uh, you know, OCD will probably tell you that. Um, uh, I don't, uh, you know, uh, all I can say is that my first, uh, my first reaction, <laughs> Well, uh, just kind of like bug off, you know, um, you don't get it. You're not experiencing it. So, and you know, it's just, it's a hard thing. Um, so, but, uh, you know, I'm out there and I'm not always the best resource because, uh, sometime I'll talk about the Enneagram and that I think I, you know, I think I can model some of my sentiments very, very well with the Type 5 um, in that I'm very private and very secretive. <laughs> I want to say secretive, but, you know, very, very uh, militantly kept boundaries of personal space, even though I don't come off that way and it's not fair to other people. And so, you know, obviously having a YouTube channel and responding to all these people can be hard to sometimes because it's like, ah, I'm having to give out so much of myself and I want to conserve it. You know, you look up type five, but I'll talk about that another time. But anyway, I'm only saying that because I'm sort of preemptively apologizing in the case that uh, in the event that uh, I, I am not as 100% perfectly uh, uh, able to, you know, offer sympathy. And by the way, I'm not a psychologist. Please do not, please do not mistake me for a true therapist, you know. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not trained. Yes, I know that you don't care that I'm not trained because you think I'm so wonderful. But, um, you know... Anyway, I don't know what I'm saying. Sorry. I apologize. Um, but, um, excuse me. I think that's all I have for this one. Um, you know, it kind of went all over the place, but I think I've gotten it out and it's about as good as it's going to get. So thanks for hearing me out. I hope that this was helpful to some people. Um, you know, it's good to get it out there. Um, so... Yeah, I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you.